Lord, we sometimes fail to see your workings when we are sitting and watching closely to see what you have done. Sometimes, Lord, we miss the work that you are doing, and we feel like maybe you're doing nothing at all. As we enter this time of study and thought, be present with us and expose to us the ways that you are acting in our lives and the lives of others, so that we may know your true and full grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Once upon a time, pretty long ago, in a place called Cana, which was ten miles north of Nazareth, there was a bride and a groom. They threw a wedding and it was a huge affair, it was a big deal. They invited people from everywhere. It was a lavish affair. But this story really isn't about a bride and her groom. In fact, so far as I can tell, the wedding is just a backdrop, just the place where it happened. The party lasted for days, and then, on the third day, you know, that sounds familiar, on the third day. Where have I heard that before? Another story? Another time when the Bible says on the third day? But it can't be, because that's way at the end. That's way at the end of this story. Hmm. Well, the party, at the party there was a woman. And she was there with her son, Jesus. And some of his friends had attended the party too. Well, they weren't exactly friends. They were friendly, but they were his followers. They were all at this big wedding party together. And on that third day, something happened that was on the level of a social media disaster. The wine had begun to run out. You can imagine what a disaster that was. A wedding with no wine. Who's ever heard of such a thing? Somehow Jesus' mother noticed that shortly the party would be disrupted by the lack of wine. It was supposed to be a seven-day party, but the emptiness of these wine jugs felt like it meant death to the party. Death. Mary knew that something had to be done, and so she went to her son, and she nudged him to get his attention. They don't have any more wine, she said. She didn't ask for anything. That was all that she said. They don't have any more wine. She just wanted to make sure he knew what was going on. Of course he knew. But still, it's, she told him, and it seems like it mattered to her that he do something about it. Jesus must have perceived that she was trying to get him to do something. She was praying that he would do something, take some action, and change the course of the party so that it wasn't a horrible flop and an embarrassment to the family. She wanted to keep things festive. But he said, woman, what concern of it is mine? What concern is it of mine or of yours? It wasn't quite rude, but it wasn't quite polite either. I mean, he called her woman. I don't think I would get away with calling my mother woman. Was he telling her that by asking this, she was changing their relationship? 
Things would change forever if she requested this of him. And if he did it, if he gave the first sign, he would no longer be only her baby boy, her sweet, adorable baby boy, but he would be her savior. Was he reminding her that he no longer served at her pleasure, but only at God's? Then he said, my time has not yet come. That sounds familiar. I've heard that somewhere before, right? Somewhere in the scripture he says it over and over and over again. Do you remember? He says it until that day when he finally says, my time has come. It's as though he knew what he was doing all along. As though he knew in that moment that committing to this path was securing his death. Is she aware that he knows what he's doing and that he will die if he provides this sign? Perhaps she's resigned to it, to him following God's orders and giving him, and she's trying to give him the guts to find the courage to do it. Whatever Mary knew, her response is as direct, but not confrontational. Mary is done with talking to Jesus. She's just done with it. She says nothing more to him. But she looks to the servants and she says, do whatever he tells you to do. <clears throat> what would Jesus tell them to do? It's pretty smooth, really. That's a, a grade A mother trick. I'm just going to divert. I know you will make the right decision, she says. The argument is over. And even though she's not directly asked him for anything, she seems to have confidence that he will do what she is implying he should. In the corner, there were six stone jars, jugs, big jugs, that hold 20 or 30 gallons, huge. They're used for the ritual washing as part of a wedding service. Ritual washing. Now where have I heard that before? I know I just heard a story maybe in the last week or two about ritual washing in the Jewish tradition as a sign of repentance. Does that, does that sound familiar to you guys? Last week? Oh. <laughs> kind of sounds like that story, but Jesus and his disciples have already repented and been baptized. I must be off topic again. Except it does seem interesting that the jugs were used instead of whatever containers had held the wine before. Jugs used for repentance and cleansing were used instead of the same old wineskins. And how many jugs were there? Six. Six. The same as the number of days it took for God to create the heavens and the earth before God took a Sabbath. Isn't that odd? But I'm way off topic. I'll get back on it. So, God, so Jesus told the servants to fill the jugs with water and then to dip a ladle in and bring it to the steward and let him taste it. And they did just that, and the steward was quite shocked when he tasted the best wine he had ever tasted. There was something about that wine, something different. Now, I remember another story about wine. And it had something to do with salvation. What was it? When people drank wine and they had been purified and then they were united together 
Oh, wait, I'm off topic again, I'm sorry. The steward was amazed, and the wine was so good, and he thought, it must be an oversight of the host. Surely the people of God have been given salvation through Jesus first. Oh, no, wait, I'm off topic again. Here I go again, I mean, I mean, they should have been given the good wine first, not in the middle. And there was such an abundance of wine. But I suppose, as you hear this story, you may wonder, where is that abundance now? You may look at your life and feel like your wineskins are still empty, and you may wonder if water of purification will become spiritual salvation. Hmm. We're only halfway through that story. But the party that day went on with great joy, because God cares about our joy and wants us to celebrate heartily. We are a celebration people. But what about your empty cup? What do you think? Will you get to drink the extravagant gift that Jesus offers us? Are you ready to celebrate? And if wine is needed and there isn't any, will his wine be enough to satisfy you? Will you offer whatever you have on hand to make that wine with him? Am I off point again? No, I don't think so. But back to the party. The wedding, the joining of two people in covenant under God's blessing. I mean the man and the woman went on until the fullness of its time. And there was much celebrating. But I won't say the end. Amen. Let us pray. O God who moves over water, and transforms it into a vehicle of celebration, who gives us strong symbols of water, of wine, of bread, of body, that join us together as one people. Let your spirit of celebration live on in us now. May we feel your presence in this time and place. May we know the joy the wine you provide. In Jesus' name, amen.